Hello there and welcome to this PowerShell.org tech session entitled Filter Left, Format Right. My name is Tim Warner. I'm a full-time technical trainer with Pluralsight, as well as a PowerShell.org video contributor. I want to get right into the code with you, so let's take care of some preliminaries as efficiently as possible. What we're doing here is working one by one through the gotcha section of PowerShell.org. Today, of course, we're concerned with the aphorism, filter left, format right. If you don't know what that means, don't worry, you will before too long. You can get today's PowerShell script from my own personal website, timwarnertech.com forward slash filter format dot zip. Let's get to work. Here we are on a representative Windows Server 2012 R2 server, but this could just as well be your administrative workstation. Without any further ado, we'll open the Windows PowerShell Integrated Scripting Environment, or ISE, as an administrator. To do that, you can right-click the PowerShell icon wherever you find it and select Run ISE as Administrator from the Jump menu. I already have the application up, and I've already loaded the script filter left format right dot ps1. Just as a general practice on scripts that I use for demos, I tend to include the break statement at the very top. This prevents the entire file contents from running or attempting to run if I were to press F5 or click the Run Script button on the toolbar. Anyway, we're all about tips and tricks with PowerShell. In the header of the script file, I just give you some metadata and some contact information, as well as some bit.ly URLs that point to some related web pages that you might find informative based on today's discussion. You'll also notice that in the script I've used regions to break up the different sections. Regions are defined very easily. You just do pound region and then the name. To end a region, it's pound end region with no space. And at that point, you can just collapse or expand expand the region as you would. Let me delete that. And finally, Control M is a really nice toggle to expand and collapse regions. Now let's get into the content here. Today's tech session is about the best practice of filter left format right. What the heck does that mean? I'm not going to presume that you're coming into this tech session understanding what that means. Well, let's set up our environment first of all. I'm going to set my location to my C drive. Looks like I'm already there in my ISC console. I want to run P PS version table dot PS version to access the specific PowerShell version that I'm running just for comparison purposes in case you see anything different on your workstation. I'm running Windows Management Framework 5.0 RTM or Release to Manufacturing. You'll also want to make sure that your PowerShell help files are updated. Remember that Windows PowerShell does not ship with local help by default. And by adding in force, this will force a check. By default, update help actually makes the call to the Microsoft servers only once every 24 hours. And I'm adding error action silently continue just so I don't get any red on my screen no matter what. Finally, get execution policy. You see that I've set mine to bypass, which allows me to run any script. I am in a trusted environment, so that's not a big deal. Filter left, format right. Well, let's take that title, that session title, one piece at a time. First, let's take a look at filtering. If you're familiar with, for instance, the structured query language, or SQL, that's used with relational database systems, you're accustomed to doing something like, let me actually type it up here, select name and salary from a table called employees where salary is greater than, I don't know, how many zeros do you want? <laughs> order by salary in descending order. You see, that's a typical SQL statement. And you notice that we're starting off by selecting columns from a table, and then we're performing some row filtering with where, and we're doing some sorting with order by. This is a rudimentary pipeline-ish statement isn't it? Now the filtering is taking place here specifically at that WHERE clause. And we can do the same thing in Windows PowerShell a couple different ways, and hence leads us to our first suggestion, to filter as far to the left in your pipeline as possible. As an example, this machine we're on is an Active Directory domain controller, and Dell owns the intellectual property of a series of AD management modules called Quest Active Roles modules. And technically this is an old school snap-in, but anyway, I'm going to select this line to load the Quest Active Roles AD management snap 
snap in into our run space. And then in line 28, I'll run get command where the noun of the commandlet starts with QAD. Why am I doing that? Just to show you that we have a lot of flexibility for managing, for instance, Active Directory users, groups, and objects. That having been said, let's get into some filtering examples and their possible performance implications. We can use get QAD user to get a list of every Active Directory user account in the current directory. But if we only wanted to see users from, say, our Nashville office, if you're like me, you'll probably want to pipe to the where object command, constructing an expression here such that the current object's office property should equal Nashville. And then I've gone even further here just for grins and piped into set QAD user to set the office to something different. In other words, let's say that all of our Nashville employees are now the name of their office is now Antioch instead of Nashville. So that should work just fine. And if you run that, okay, it looks like it came back with two employees. And if we were to go in and look at their distinguished name, chances are we'd see that their office has been updated correctly. Why do we care about this? Well, for this simple example, that return came back pretty quickly. But if you're dealing with a directory of hundreds, thousands, or tens of thousands of user accounts, you're going to be sitting there twiddling your thumbs quite a while while this action takes place. Thus, it's important when we use Windows PowerShell to try to use the tool and to construct our pipelines for greater efficiency. So where object is great as far as it goes. It allows you to do object by object filtering. But remember that many commandlets also support what I call in-place filtering. In other words, you can filter in that part of the pipeline. For instance, look at line 34. The get QAD user commandlet actually allows you to filter on properties directly. That's why I've, I'm using the quest active directory snap-in as an example, because it's really well written. So we can bypass this where object business, and even more importantly, we can reduce the number of objects right at the outset that we're passing into set QAD user. You see what I'm saying? This becomes even more to the point when you're using commands that have a computer name parameter and you're grabbing objects from multiple machines and then serializing them over the network to come back to the workstation that you're on where you're calling the stuff. In fact, let's look at an example of that. On line 37, we're using get WMI object to look at SIM data file. Now, this computer name is just localhost now, but imagine that this was maybe a get content from a file that had a hundred computer names on it. You see, if we're using where object, then that means that this part of the pipeline, this call here, has to run fully before we start filtering the results. So we're creating a lot of extra network traffic that we don't need. Wouldn't it be better to perform the filtering as far to the left or the source of the pipeline as possible? And that way, once we get to our where object and we start filtering, like this example is going to look at all files on the computer and come back only where the file name includes the extension DLL. As I said, some commandlets include either direct property access, like we saw with get QAD user, or they include the standard filter parameter that allows you to make performance improvements like that. So see how this works. On line 40, get WMI object, sim data file, computer name, it can be whatever. But look, the commandlet includes a filter parameter where you can pass in an expression. That means anything we might want to do afterwards using piping or the next block in your function, whatever, is going to have a lot less, potentially a lot less data to have to work through. That's beautiful. So if you're like me and you're the inquisitive sort, you're probably thinking to yourself, how can I get a quick run of my built-in PowerShell commands that include the filter parameter? Well, I'm glad you've asked. First down in the console, let me CLS to clear the screen. And what I'm doing on line 43 is running get command where the parameter name is filter. Now I could just run that, but as a PowerShell guy, I like to format the data as much as possible. In fact, that's the second half of this presentation for that matter. And actually what I'm doing here is grabbing those commandlets that include just that filter and we'll just select out name and source properties and we'll do a format table auto size to make sure that our table results aren't shrinking or blocking any data. Okay, let me hit my hide script pane here and let's take a look. It's actually a pretty significant list. Quite a few of the item commands include filters, get child item, 
Kingdom, which is one of the most popular bread and butter commandlets, includes that ability. And the item commandlets are notable because item is what you use normally when you're tapping into your PS drives, like your certificate store or your registry and so on. And again, it's nice to be able to use a filter expression right off the bat. In summary, the, our first take-home rule is to filter using parameters instead of where object wherever possible, and we do that for performance and efficiency region, reasons. All right, now let's take a look at some metrics, some quantitative data. Credit to Microsoft MVP Bo Prox for this code and this idea. It's from his blog. He created a couple simple tests here that allow us to run some synthetic operations. Now, what the heck does that mean? Well, by wrapping this little loop inside of measure command, it allows us to get quantitative data on how long the enclosed loop takes to run. And what's happening here is that we're taking 1 through 25, and then for each of those 25 runs, we're running get done. WMI object, Win32 service, computer name localhost. So we're getting a full run of every service on the system where object, let me expand this more, where the object state equals running. Okay, so this is a synthetic test. It's the equivalent, quote unquote, equivalent of running this command against 25 separate machines. Now, of course, it's not production equivalent, but it's close enough for horseshoes, as they say. I received a parser error. I'm going to need to adjust this code. Yeah, I had two problems going on. You probably have been noticing instead of the cursor, I've had the block. So I was accidentally in insert mode and I messed up the line spacing. PowerShell can be persnickety unless you make sure to break a line at, say, a pipe or using the backtick character. Let's run this again. And by using the where object method to filter, it looks like it took 3.29 seconds to run that. Now let's compare that by taking the same code and this time using the filter parameter instead of where object. We'll select those lines and press F8 to run the selection. Total seconds 1.7. So perhaps it wasn't dramatic, but what I challenge you to do is that in your workloads, your production workloads, run some of these measure command tests and see what happens. While we're working with filtering our output as we run it through a PowerShell pipeline, there's another important principle here that I want to make sure that you understand, and that is to never forget to select any properties that you want to do work on. So this can be really confusing, so it's important that we're covering it today in this session. Now look on line 66. We're doing a get service, and that's just a get service with all the bells and whistles. So we're taking a potentially large amount of data and throwing it into select object. And here I'm selecting out the properties name and display name. And then finally, given that data, we're going into where object status is stopped. And and I hope that you're thinking to yourself, whoa, wait a minute now, what's wrong with this picture? In the third portion of the pipeline, we're looking to do filtering on a property that we haven't selected out. Just like in structured query language with databases, that select is going to limit the output to only those columns or in PowerShell language properties that you've selected. So you'll wind up seeing some really weird results sometimes. For instance, this actually isn't too weird because we would expect not to get anything back. I guess by weird, I mean that you're not going to see the PowerShell parser throw an error. It's just going to sort of ignore you. The behavior reminds me a bit of how forgiving XHTML is. If HTML, when your browser is parsing it, find some inconsistencies, unless it's something dramatic, the web browser, the parser will just ignore it and keep on going to attempt to render the rest of the page. Here we have a get select sort issue, where we're doing a get service, selecting out name and display name, and attempting to sort on a property that we haven't selected. But check it out. When you run it, you get results back. And you may be asking yourself, maybe the PowerShell parser is taking status and is doing a sword on it. And if we looked at deeper into this, maybe we'd find out. Well, I asked my friend Adam Bertram, all credit goes to him, and he ran a really nice three-line test here that defines a variable A using the get select sort, and then B as get select, and looking to compare one to the other. So let's select those lines. 
and there's no difference. So what I'm trying to say here is that PowerShell's not going to complain. In fact, I have that written down here on line 80. PowerShell's not going to complain, but you want to make sure to select the properties that you want to perform action on. So back in the previous example here, name, display name, I'll want to add status if I want to get results back, which I have here. Easy fix. Sometimes also, you may get a performance improvement structuring your sorts and selects in particular ways. For instance, would it make more sense from a performance standpoint and an efficiency standpoint to do your sort first or your select first? Well, I think I have it right here because imagine if we did a sort object property status and then selected. We're taking all of the data from get service, running a sort on the entire data set, and then we're performing our select. So I would suggest that you select Select out the properties you need, if that is in fact what you want to do, and then pass that further down the pipeline into where or sort. I was chatting with Don Jones about this issue, and he reminded me of the set strict mode commandlet. Let me clear the screen down below. And if I, for instance, set strict mode on, so the parser is going to be a lot more rigid in how it interprets your PowerShell code, I'm setting it to be strict to PowerShell v3. And then I attempt a get select where on an property that I haven't selected. Well, let's take a look and see what happens. Whoa, we get blood on the screen, as my friend Jason Helmick says, and the results couldn't be clearer. The property status cannot be found on this object. Verify that the property exists. Pretty cool, huh? We can turn strict mode off just by doing a set strict mode with the off switch parameter. So there's our second of three take home rules. Now let's move away from filtering and finish up by looking at formatting. If you're thinking, boy, we put a lot of emphasis on filtering, that's absolutely true. The filtering part is really where your creativity as a PowerShell scripter comes in. PowerShell, you're going to find, if you haven't already, has a whole formatting subsystem. And by default, it has algorithms for determining how it displays your output, whether it comes back in table view or list view and so on. That having been said, you will run into problems unless you have a clear understanding of how that formatting subsystem works. So what do I mean? Well, look on 85 here. Let's imagine we wanted to generate an inventory of our free space and used space on our system volumes, and we needed to generate that output as an HTML report. So what we have here is a get WMI object call into the class Win32 logical disk, and we are using a filter here to look just for volumes, and then I'm breaking the lines at the pipe. This is all one huge, let's see, from here down to here is just a single pipeline, if you can believe it. We're selecting out the properties PS computer name, and then I'm using the hash table syntax to play some games with the results that come back. Because normally WMI object gives you this ridiculous output in bytes. But to make it more user friendly, we want to convert to gigabytes. It's beyond our scope today discussing either hash tables or these conversions. But but the results are actually pretty nice. Let me just show you what it looks like by selecting and doing an F8. See? So we can get a nice run of our volumes. Now it looks like this isn't a complete script because I'm not including the volume letter, but that's not really the point here. The point is we have this nice tabular output and we want to do a convert to HTML, right? Because we want to have a report named disk report. And then I'm going to do a start I explore to load that into view for us. So let's select all these lines and do a run selection. That does not look at all like that previous output that gave us a fairly nice table here. What the heck is going on here? Well, what we're seeing here in the browser is a bunch of formatting codes. Let's do a right click view source and we can see here microsoft.powershell.commands.internal.format.autosize, format.tableheader. These are all formatting codes that PowerShell understands, but of course that's not HTML. So we've got some kind of fundamental disconnect or some kind of fundamental problem here. Let me jump right to line 97. The final take home rule for today is in general, don't pipe format commands to anything else. Filter left, format right. If you don't include a format command, as I said, there's a built-in subsystem in PowerShell that will choose an output display for you, a view as it's called. You can always create your own views and that's beyond our scope as well. 
But understand that when you're terminating a pipeline and you want to do some kind of format, maybe you're manually going to invoke format list or format wide, that's cool, but don't pipe to anything after that or you're in big trouble. So really the, the main block is this format table auto size call. That's not good. The exception here on line 99 is that the out commands do understand PowerShell formatting commands just fine. And even though you probably aren't even aware of it, you're using out commands with every single command you run, even single commands like just get service. Let me do on line 100 a get command where the verb is out. There's just a handful of them. We see out grid view, which is a really nice way to show data in a tabular external window. Out printer, out string, out file. You've probably used that all the time to get a simple text file of your results. But what I want to draw your attention to specifically in these out commands are out default and out host. When we're working, say, in the console here in the ISE or the traditional PowerShell console, anything you do command-wise or pipeline-wise is going to go to out default unless you specify a different out command like out grid view or out file. Out default, by default, <laughs> will go to out host. And host is the PowerShell engine running in a particular context. The PowerShell ISE is one host. The PowerShell console, the traditional command console, is the console host. And there are other hosted applications like Active Directory Administrative Center and so on and so forth. Therefore, to come back to our original code, I just simply removed the call to format table let me actually get rid of this line because I don't care about it. But if I run this, taking our results to here, converting them to HTML, and then generating the HTML file, we should see a much more palatable result. In summary, we learned, number one, to filter using parameters instead of where object wherever possible. Make sure that you select properties you need for further processing down the pipeline. And finally, pipe format commands only to out commands as a general best practice. Again, you can find the script at timwarnertech.com forward slash filter format dot zip. You can find related videos at the PowerShell org YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash PowerShell org. And of course, the community site is just simply powershell.org. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, curiosities, complaints, whatever, anything else beginning with C or any other letter, feel free to reach out to me directly. My email address is timothy-warner at pluralsite.com. Alternatively, you can find me at LinkedIn or Twitter at Tech Trainer Tim. Thanks a lot for joining us. I hope you got a lot out of this presentation. Happy PowerShelling. Take good care.